So we're going to begin our after lunch portion of this year's conference. And I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Sajadi is a behavioral neurologist, professor of neurology, and also holds an uh, appointment in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at UC Irvine. Uh, Dr. Sajadi has um, just been a fantastic addition to UCI Health, the Department of Neurology, and UCI Mind. He's a very active clinician, but also a very active researcher. He um, has great interest in a host of neurodegenerative conditions and has already been funded by the National Institutes of Health on multiple grants to study uh, varying dementing disorders. <clears throat> um, he was recently promoted to associate professor at UCI, which means he is tenured, and we hope that means he's going to stick around forever because he's been uh, a tour de force for us. He is going to give a talk about uh, one of his recent interests, uh, LATE. Uh, he's going to tell us what that stands for so I don't screw it up. Um, uh, and this, in our lifespan focus uh, of dementia, is a pathology that seems critically important at older ages. So please welcome Dr. Sajadi. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And um, so as Dr. Grail mentioned, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you and fill your post-perennial minutes uh, with this very important topic, which is uh, introducing a basically new degenerative uh, pathology called LATE. These are my disclosures, and I let you go through them. And um, just to give you an outline of the talk, I'm going to, to give you some introduction and some historical backgrounds, and then um, introduce the topic, which is limbic predominant age-related TDP43 encephalopathy, and because it's a mouthful late and short, and hope to convince you in the next 20 minutes or so that it is an important degenerative pathology that we need to pay more attention to and study. So just to give you a bit of background, I re very much like this um, figure from uh, Census Bureau that kind of depicts the change in population demographics uh, over the past um, 60 years and uh, looking forward in the next 40 years, sort of moving from this pyramid to the pillar. And kind of as you see, back in the 60s, the biggest demographic group were the little ones. And now, and moving forward, uh, the older end of aging spectrum seems to become more uh, populated. And if you pay attention to that 85 and over female kind of contribution in, by year 2060, that's almost the biggest chunk. So that's why studying the conditions we study are relevant from a public health perspective. Now, and to give you some uh, projections about Alzheimer's disease, of course we all know uh, the degenerative brain disorders for the reason I just mentioned are the healthcare tsunamis of the 21st century. And particularly relevant for the oldest old portion of our aging population because they are the fastest growing segment of our population. Looking at the stats of people who suffer from Alzheimer's dementia uh, now, this is a, a figure from Alzheimer's Association uh, from 2022, you see uh, almost tertiles of age epochs from 65 to 74, 75 to 84 and 85 and plus equal portions suffering from Alzheimer's type dementia now. But fast forward to year 2060 and you will realize that that 85 and over portion represents almost half of those who will suffer from dementia come year 2060. So that's one background. Uh, the second background I want to tell you about, about how our understanding about dementia and the underpinnings of dementia has evolved over the decades. Back in the 70s, it was all considered hardening of the arteries. It was the senile dementia, and, uh, but that's how people thought about it. In the 80s, we came to realize that mo most of these patients who have the so-called senile dementia actually have underlying Alzheimer's pathology. And also the importance of having multiple infarcts leading to cognitive impairment was recognized. 
In the 90s, dementia with Lewy bodies came to the fort and uh, we recognized their importance and their clinical presentation that was kind of particular. In the 2000s, uh, we heard a fantastic talk about frontotemporal dementia and the importance of them affecting people in the younger ages became relevant. And more recently, in the last decade, we have seen uh, basically development and introduction of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, hippocampal sclerosis, and more recently, late. So as our understanding about these conditions have evolved, we are dealing with multitude of degenerative pathologies that are all relevant when it comes to cognitive impairment. Another very important point, uh, as a clinician, I see patients in clinic and I diagnose Alzheimer's dementia all the time. But what I have to realize and what I, have, I like to communicate with you is that there is a disconnect between Alzheimer's dementia as a clinical diagnosis and the un underlying Alzheimer's pathology, what the pathologist sees under the microscope. So um, it, it, it is not the case that all cases who have clinically uh, diagnosed Alzheimer's disease have Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, colleagues at Rush University have looked at this and with a, with a concept called attributable risk. And what they have found is less than 50% of what is diagnosed in clinic as Alzheimer's disease is actually due to Alzheimer's pathology. And we have a whole host of other pathologies that I try to highlight. Do you see my highlight? Perfect. So the two conditions that are relevant to my talk are these two, um, hippocampal sclerosis and TDP43, and as you see, they account for about 20%. And then we have the Lewy bodies, we have the cerebral amyloid angiopathies, and we have various forms of vascular pathologies that are relevant when it comes to a diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Now, just switching gear after this introduction, talking about TDP43, which is the subject in late. So what is TDP43? As you heard uh, from Dr. Yubenkov earlier, uh, it is an important pathology in frontotemporal dementia. Uh, it stands for transactive response, or TAR, DNA binding protein of 43 kilodalton. It is a kind of protein that is ubiquitously present in all cell nuclei, so everywhere in the body you look, you will find TDP43 in the cell nucleus. And we don't really know what it does, but we, our best guess is that it's, it's a regulator of gene expression, and um, that's its main role. The problem arises when it starts to, get, starts to get trapped in the cytoplasm. So when it comes to the cytoplasm and not get back to the nucleus, it gets phosphorylated, and it clogs, and it gets in the way of normal functions of the cell and potentially causes neurodegeneration. So as you heard earlier, it is a very important pathology in frontotemporal dementia, and because our theme today is dementia across the age spectrum, I just want to show you that TDP43 is potentially relevant across the uh, basically life uh, portion that matters for dementia. So in 50 to 60 years old people, it is relevant for frontotemporal dementia. In 70 to 8 year old patient, it is relevant for Alzheimer's disease because it can be a frequent concomitant pathology with Alzheimer's disease. And as people get older, uh, 85 and over, it becomes relevant for hippocampal sclerosis and the pathology we were going to talk about, which is late. This is another way of showing this. Uh, when it comes to frontotemporal dementia, we have two proteins, and TDP43 is one of them. With Alzheimer's pathology, of course, we have the amyloid and the tau, but TDP43 is an important concomitant pathology. And when it comes to hippocampal sclerosis and late, TDP43 is the main pathology. So it is a very relevant uh, protein abnormality uh, across the uh, degenerative syndromes and across the ages. So let's talk about late. So late is a relatively new concept. Before year 2019, nobody knew what late was because that's the year that the paper was published and introduced the a construct, which late is. So uh, it is basically to, it, it, the, the reason it was um, kind of publicized was that it was this increased understanding and notion that TDP43 is not only relevant for patients who are younger and have frontotemporal dementia, but is also very important as people get older. And this sort of late terminology was trying to highlight that point. It remains a pathology diagnosis at this point, and hence the NC sort of suffix, which uh, means neuropathologic change. So when we talk about late, uh, this is something we see on the, the microscope on the brain of people who passed away at this point. Look, doing the retrospective studies, we know that it is pretty common pathology in people who pass after the age of 85, up to 30% or more than 30% 
of uh, participants in research cohorts who have come to autopsy do have TDP43 uh, pathology. In terms of its clinical presentation, again, retrospectively, we know that it is an amnestic, it causes an amnestic syndrome, which means that a memory predominant uh, issue. And for that reason, during life, it gets misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease. In terms of pathology, we recognize three stages for its spread. So it starts from a part of the brain called amygdala, which is uh, in the middle part of the temporal lobe uh, behind our ears, basically. And then from there, it spreads to the hippocampus, which is a memory relevant organ of the brain. And from there, it spreads to the rest of the brain. So um, that's the pattern of a spread, and we recognize three stages for late. So we at UCI have been fortunate to have access to amazing database allowing us to look into uh, this important pathology that affects people uh, towards the later stages of their life. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about the 90 plus study, which is an amazing study co-led by Dr. Kewas and Dr. Corada. Dr. Corada is here, uh, over the past 20 years or so, and it is a valuable data set that allows us to look into these important issues. The 90 plus study is a community-based study in Southern California. It, uh, as part of uh, participation in this study, participants get to have longitudinal assessments every six months, and that will include clinical assessment, neuropsychological assessment, and undergoing many more things, such as different types of scans. Um, they, are, uh, they are gracious enough to allow us to have their brains after they die, so we have high autopsy rates, and we have multitude of biomarkers available for us to ask important questions. So that's one important source of information that we have used to look into this um, late construct. The other one is called NAC, stands for National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center. It's a very valuable database that is amassed by contribution from all of the Alzheimer's disease research centers across the country. As you know, we have one at UCI, uh, hosted in UCI Mind. Um, the NAC database also includes participants who have undergone longitudinal assessments. And there are a high number of participants because, as I said, all of the ADRCs across the country contribute to it. And uh, the good thing about it is that there is a uniform pathology data set, so those who come to autopsy, we get same kinds of information on them, allowing us to ask the questions we like to answer. Just to tell you more about the demographics of the people we have studied for um, understanding more about this late construct, for the 90 plus study, uh, as you will see here, let me show you, uh, about 36% of our cohort, which is 149 individuals, actually did have the late pathology, just uh, highlighting the prevalence of this pathology in the older age. Uh, they were in their 90s when they passed, majority were female, which is in, uh, uh, in keeping with the demographics of this population at this age range. They were highly educated with around 50% having a college degree and many more with late died with dementia compared to those who didn't have late. So that's the 90 plus portion of the study and the NAC portion, we restricted the NAC uh, data to those who had passed after the age of 90 to make it comparable to the 90 plus study. And as you will see here, they were a slightly younger and slightly less female proportion, although still majority were female, and slightly more educated with college degree and more, and a more kind of prevalence of dementia in the NAC cohort compared to the 90 plus study. So the first question we asked was, is late actually important? Is it related to things that we care about? Is it related to dementia and clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? And this work was done by Davis Wood Woodworth, a uh, postdoctoral scholar I have been fortunate enough to be working with over the past few years. I cannot tell you good thing, enough good things about him. So this is the first set of results that we have. Uh, just to decipher it for you, the black color is data that comes from NAC, and the blue data is the data coming from the 90 plus study. And basically, this is a regression model uh, showing us the odds of having dementia and clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in those who died with late pathology compared to those who did not have late. And basically, this shows that those who died with late pathology were almost uh, three times more likely to die with dementia compared to those who didn't. And the results from the NAC and the 90 plus study are pretty compatible. And when it comes to clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, those who had late were more than twice as likely to have a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease compared to those who did not have it. So 
to answer that question, we think late is relevant when it comes to dementia and when it comes to a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. The next question was, uh, how is late related to other pathologies? The reason we are interested in that question is that in the older age, when people develop dementia, the rule is having more than one pathology. So it is very common for us to see more than one pathology under the microscope when we look at the brains of individuals who die as, at their older age. And the question we wanted to answer is, is somebody who dies with late more likely to have the other important pathologies that we care about? And the answer is mostly yes, according to this result. Um, again, as you see, so first of all, hippocampal sclerosis was the first condition that was significantly associated with presence of late in both cohorts. Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change was more likely to be present in those who had late pathology in both cohorts. And Lewy bodies was also more likely to be present in the brains of those who died with late pathology. Then the next question was about, what about the vascular pathologies? Uh, two common vascular pathologies that we look for under the microscope, one is atherosclerosis, which is basically formation of plaques in the bigger vessels of the brain. We didn't find any association between presence of late pathology and atherosclerosis. Arteriolosclerosis is more of a sort of curious pathology uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, we don't really know what makes you prone to get it. And at the same time, we think it's an important pathology when it comes to um, diagnosis of dementia. So our results were not concordant when it came to arteriolosclerosis. The NAC data suggested that there was a relationship, whereas the 90 plus study didn't find that relationship. So that is something we are going to look into further. So to summarize this one, we found that late was associated with most of the important degenerative pathologies uh, in, this in these two populations. Uh, vascular pathologies had a sort of mixed picture. The next question, how is the relationship of late with the cognitive domains? And what I mean by that, when we see patients in clinic, there are different sort of complaints. Some people complain of memory problems, some complain of language problems, some complain of problems getting lost and so on. So the question here is which ones or which uh, aspects of cognitive function were affected or associated with late? And here is the answer. The answer is almost all of them. Uh, when we looked at, and this is the 90 plus study data now, only 90 plus. So when we looked at association of dementia, I showed you before that it was re relevant, but we also found that those who had late were more likely to have memory problems, language problems, problems with their orientation, and problems with visual spatial function. I just take a moment to tell you what we mean by orientation, because it's an important kind of cognitive domain. So this is knowing what time it is, what date it is, what month it is, and where we are. So this is kind of being oriented to surrounding and to people around us and to time. And it was related to late. Its impairment was related to late. And to put things into context, we just wanted to compare, OK, late is related to all of these cognitive domains. How uh, involvement or impairments caused by late uh, compared to impairments caused by Alzheimer's disease? And here is the answer. And the answer is they are pretty comparable. Again, this is the 90 plus study data. The red color is Alzheimer's disease, and the blue color is late. And these are basically, again, odd ratios of having impairment in the cognitive domains that I am showing in relation to the two pathologies. And as you see, in the majority, as actually late seems to matter a bit more, if not equally, compared to Alzheimer's disease in this age group, potentially with the exception of visuospatial impairment, where Alzheimer's disease had a slightly higher odds ratio. Um, so this is to answer the question, I mean, are late and Alzheimer's disease potentially comparable in terms of their impact on cognition? And the answer is yes. So I showed you a lot of data, and just to conclude here, uh, I hope I convinced you that late neuropathologic change is a common degenerative pathology. It is important when it comes to outcomes, important outcomes such as dementia and impairment in cognitive domains. Um, its profile is very similar to that of Alzheimer's disease, so it is a tough condition or tough pathology to diagnose from and distinguish from Alzheimer's disease during life, and that highlights the need for developing biomarkers, because at this point, it remains a post-mortem diagnosis, and it is very important for us to be able to continue researching the subject to be able to have biomarkers that allow us predict who has late um, during life. So this just leaves me to acknowledge the 
great contribution of all of my colleagues uh, in the 90 plus study, especially Dr. Kavos and Dr. Corrada, all of the members of my lab and the names you see is a small representation, colleagues at Stanford who did the pathology work on the uh, 90 plus study and uh, great support of the National Institute of Health that uh, allowed us to do this work. Most importantly, however, we are indebted to the research participants, both in the 90 plus study and nationally, because the data we use, as I told you, was uh, national data from National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center. I'll leave you with this picture from, uh, many, uh, from one of our many Zoom meetings over the past two years, and thank you so much for your attention. Great, excellent talk. It's, uh not too late for questions. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Just got some sympathy laughs at the end there. Right. <laughs> questions for Dr. Sajadi. I see a hand. Hi, thank you. I wasn't sure if this was implied or not. Was TDP, did you look at the relationship without amyloid and, uh, and tau? Or is it only with those two proteins? That's a great question. Um, no. Uh, so. I, should potentially, I mean, this is the further detail. Uh, so the regression analysis I showed you were adjusting for the other pathologies. Um, so like when I show you their associations with TDP, they are already adjusted for all the other pathologies. Okay, that is there are interest relevant. in seeing what AD, I'm sorry, TDP43 on its own, how it affects the brain or? Does that make sense at all? It does, absolutely. No, it does make sense. So we do think TDP has an independent contribution and impact on the brain health. But as I told you, since uh, we have multiple pathologies on, in one brain, when we do our analysis to be robust and to make sure that we are not attributing something that, uh, that is attributable to other pathologies, we always adjust and account for the effect of other pathologies. So the data I showed you was just the impact of TDP43 after adjusting for all the other pathologies that we might have concomitantly on the brain of people who have it. Okay, thank you. So what should our research priorities be for late moving forward? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we are, pa we are hopefully getting past the point to kind of prove the importance of and uh, the impact of TDP43 pathology um, as it contributes and causes dementia later in life. I think the next step, as I said, will be to develop biomarkers so we can study this condition during life because right now all the research we are doing is uh, basically doing post-mortem pathology sort of data. So in order to be able to track the progression of the disease and to be able to diagnose people as having it, it's important, very important, to have different types of biomarker. Uh, be it a PET scan ligand or plasma biomarkers, I mean, we need some biomarker. Hi, Dr. Sadi. Great talk. Um, I have a question about the cognitive domains being affected with TDP I don't 40. think I can hear you well if you... Oh, oh, yeah. I have cognitive a question domains. about the cognitive domains that are affected. Um, you showed the slide where people had uh, presented deficiencies across different domains. Uh, did you also look at if uh, late was associated with severity of impairment in those domains? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I mean, odds ratio kind of gets into that because, um, well, it does and doesn't. Uh, it's a good question. So right now we are doing some longitudinal analysis looking at actual neuropsychological data. Um, I didn't show that data in the interest of time. Um, but yes, it does matter. It does matter at the time of death, but it also matters when you look at decline and uh, deterioration of cognitive function, perhaps more than Alzheimer's disease pathology does actually in, in this age group. Yeah. We've got one. No, how many neglect up, up here? <laughs> oh, oh, you were going to hold it. Thank you. Um, with this type of dementia, is there a sequence of the declines, which one typically occurred first, followed by the others, or is it just across the board? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question as well. Um, we are looking into that at this point. Uh, it's, it's a bit difficult because um, it seems to be a very insidiously progressive course, and sometimes um, things are difficult to follow when you started seeing somebody who has already developed cognitive impairment, which is some of the participants in these studies. It seems to be, or basically my best guess, is that it starts with memory, 
and orientation becomes impaired relatively early on, which is kind of different compared to Alzheimer's disease in that sense, because with Alzheimer's, memory comes and then other aspects of cognitive function, for example, executive function uh, comes afterwards, and orientation is a later development or impairment in it, whereas in this one, it seems to be that memory comes first, followed by orientation problems. Great, great, excellent, thank, thank you, you so much. Okay.